Welcome to Dakota Preparedness. This video is about bomb shelters, particularly nuclear bomb shelters. Now, to be quite honest with you, for 17 years, we owned a bunker. Now, for the last eight years, we have not had a bunker. It was part of a house that we sold, but originally in the late 90s, we were looking at a house to purchase it due to a professional move that was I had elected to take. And it was a grand house. And we were pretty much sold on the house when we went down to see the basement. It was the largest basement in any house that I've ever seen, private house. And in one corner of this very large basement was a cinder block room. And when I walked into that room, I could tell that it was offset from the main um, basement in the sense that it was dug further into the hillside. And then when I realized the roof was used to support two cars for the garage, so the roof must have been four or five inches of concrete with rebar and wire. And then in the middle of that to help support it was a steel I-beam. I mean the type they put in skyscrapers with massive wood supports. So essentially what I did was repurpose that room where it hadn't been used by the previous owner. I put in about $1,500 worth of shelving and I also put in double wide steel doors. And for 17 years, we've referred to that room as our bunker. And it was, uh, I think, an excellent radiation shelter and would provide considerable blast uh, protection also. And we loved the room. We felt a great deal of security having it there. And the other item was it was wonderful to keep most of our emergency supplies there in a very organized manner. Now, I also will share with you that on one occasion, I was able to visit a bunker that was built in the 1950s. And uh, the gentleman who built the bunker and the house at the same time, which that would be very advantageous if, if you could do that, if you elected to build a bunker. But he had been a, um, uh, a civilian in Germany during the World War II, during the Allied aerial bombardment. And when he migrated to, immigrated to the United States, he insisted when he built his house that it have a bomb shelter. And when I was, uh, as a guest, was brought there to see this bunker, you um, walked from, it was an exterior entrance, you walked in from the outside, it was sloped as I recalled, for about 10 feet you walked down, you then took a left, and having an L shaped entrance like that is very advantageous, both from uh, shielding you from the blast, um, air pressure, and also from radiation. And then you opened a door and stepped into what you would have thought was the basement of the house, which essentially it was. But there was a mudroom there uh, where you could decontaminate or just use it like a traditional mudroom. And then there was a second door that took you into the actual bomb shelter. So uh, I took away the importance of the L shape, the mud room, and also they had the shelter totally set up, ready to go. There was a table in the, the middle of it, and um, it was set up as if you could have your dinner there or you could play a game uh, or something like that. And uh, the room itself could have easily uh, fit six to eight people. Uh, in an emergency, you might have been able to get 20 people in there. So a lot of design points came out of that. Now, let me go through some key design points, looking back of being a previous owner of a bomb shelter and also visiting that one private residence. The first design point is operational security is extremely important if you have a bunker. There's a famous Twilight 
TV episode show called The Shelter that was uh, produced in 1961, where due to a false alarm, uh, the owners of a dedicated bomb shelter rush to the shelter and close it up, but then all the neighbors want in. So the whole episode is about the drama of the neighborhood wanting to get into the bomb shelter, the family not wanting them to uh, come in because there wasn't enough room and supplies, and then finally they find out it's a false alarm. So in the 17 years we owned the bunker, we uh, never discussed it with anybody outside of our immediate family, and I am quite pleased that uh, during those 17 years, to my knowledge, no one knew about the bunker. Um, and I would think you'd want to do a similar if you decided to proceed ahead with a bunker. And that uh, kind of precludes certain things, like uh, if you live in a traditional neighborhood and you're having it built as a the bunker as an afterthought, how is that going to work? I mean, you show up with some heavy machinery that digs this huge hole and then a crane to lift the precast concrete uh, bomb shelter in or pre pre uh, welted uh, steel uh, bunker in and uh, everybody in the neighborhood's going to know about it so i think you're back to the twilight zone 1961 you'll want them everybody in the neighborhood will want to get in there with you and so uh, either you have to keep it a secret or be prepared to have share it with the whole neighborhood now, number two, I think before you ever even seriously considered a bunker, you uh, would want to get educated, and there are some excellent sources to get educated. One is uh, called the Nuclear War Survival Skills, and this book is a classic. You can find it at Amazon. They appear to have plenty of them. It costs, a hard copy is about $24. And I believe you can download it for free. Now, another book that is less known but is just excellent. It's so well written and uh, is this book right here called The Survive the Coming Nuclear War, How to Do It. And it's uh, by two authors, Ronald Crudit, and, who is a journalist. And the book just really reads well. And then actually his father, uh, Robert Cruitt, who is a medical doctor, so it has lots of detail in it. And to find it on Amazon, what I had to do was type Ronald Cruitt, C-R-U-I-T. And you can find it as a used book. And the prices range from $10 to $17, but there's not too many left. So if you want to get one of those, uh, you should quickly do so. Now, there's a third source. It's called Life After Doomsday by Bruce D. Clanton, Ph.D. You can find this on Amazon also, and as, uh, as I recall, it's fairly reasonable, um, $10, $10, $20, and it's also uh, only available now as a used book. Now, the fourth source I would recommend to you is an organization that I recently joined and their website is the Journal of Civic Defense and f at the current time you can join for free and their journal that they publish I believe twice a year is truly just excellent and uh, it's current it's just chock full of very valuable information so I would encourage you to go to the website for the Journal of Civil Defense and join. And that's a private organization, um, or public organization. It's, it's, to my knowledge, not in any way affiliated with any governmental unit. The third design point is do a threat assessment before you <laughs> seek out to to expend the expenditure and the effort and energy to have a bunker. And you should uh, go to the internet and search for a possible nuclear weapon target maps for your state. As a matter of fact, there's several sources for this type of thing, but the one that I like, I simply Google 
nuclear weapon target map four and insert the name of the state you're interested and I'll show uh, several of the states of the maps so you want to look at that map and see are you currently within a 20 mile radius of a, um, a conceivable nuclear target by one of our foreign enemies our future foreign enemies now those maps are not guaranteed that that will happen but if you start to search the logic behind them somebody put a lot of effort into uh, projecting that that might be a possible nuclear site and the biggest piece of advice I can share with you is if you're within one of those projected target sites within 20 miles of it you need to do a strategic relocation you need to move at least 20 miles away preferably 35 50 or 100 miles away and that may require you um, to do all sorts of things but as far as a nuclear war that's the safest thing be a long way away from when the bomb would explode number four you need to understand and obtain a Geiger counter and this would be the case even if you don't have a bunker matter of fact they'd be even more important but the one that uh, I utilize and have done a video on is called the GQ Geiger counter GMC 500 plus it's available at Amazon and it currently sells for $148 a fifth concept to understand is what's called half thickness in other words what shielding material would cut the amount of radiation in half so to give you some examples stone is 2.2 inches so if it's a hundred rim on the side that has the nuclear fallout with 2.2 inches of stone you would have 50 and then 2.2 more inches of stone you would have 25 and so on concrete is 2.4 inches brick is 2.8 inches sand is 2.9 inches interesting enough um, water is 7.2 inches so it's a fairly good insulator probably the most well-known insulator for a bomb shelter is packed earth which the half thickness is 3.6 inches number six is the importance as I previously mentioned of having an L shape in the entrance and a mudroom would be number seven number eight would be do you want a nuclear biological chemical air filter now these are quite expensive but they are available matter of fact the company uh, Atlas survival shelters will sell you apparently a nuclear biological chemical NBC filter by itself and a year ago uh, the unit um, that they were showing was nine thousand dollars so they are expensive but it would add it considerably to uh, the effectiveness of your shelter now there's three general types of shelters there's a spectrum between them there's probably hybrids but one is a storm shelter which I'm really not going to address those uh, I think if you're in a tornado prone area there's probably local companies that will sell those I understand the price uh, points are like five thousand ten thousand fifteen thousand and so it might be very prudent to obtain a shelter like that for just tornadoes for example another thing to keep in mind is the effectiveness of a shelter depends naturally on the size and yield of the nuclear bomb but as a general statement within five mile radius um, you're probably not going to do well matter of fact if you're within five miles of a nuclear uh, weapons explosion you're probably going to be vaporized or die within days the distance from the blast as I've mentioned um, it's best to be more than 20 miles away the type of construction of the bunker is certainly important 
I personally, my advice, if you need to build a bunker that's a blast shelter, in other words, you're going to be absorbing the thermal wave and the thermal uh, pressure within 20 miles, you should move. So uh, I'm not that big on um, blast shelters because I think you should relocate strategically to an area which is highly unlikely not to be um, involved in a nuclear incident. Now, a radiation shelter makes a lot of sense. Also is the amount of time spent in the bunker. Now, the radiation from a uh, nuclear explosion rapidly decays. So if you can stay in a bunker for 48 to 72 hours, two to three days, it will dramatically decrease. And to be on the safe side, you should stay for 14 days. Now, there could be a case where uh, the first day there's a massive exchange of nuclear weapons and then a trickle of weapons uh, in the following week. So you might have to extend that 14 days. I also can see a scenario where it'd be the reverse of that. <clears throat> in other words, there'd be a surgical strike of a few military targets and uh, are a demonstration of their ability to strike you with a nuclear weapon and then hopefully that's the end of it but maybe then it becomes a trickle until it's finally uh, large salvos of missiles coming so one issue is effectiveness another thing to consider is the legality of it. Now, it's perfectly legal to own a private bunker in the United States, but I uh, believe in being very mainstream and within the rule of law, so you should check with local uh, uh, county and city uh, building permits and that sort of thing. Um, you might want to call it a man cave where you're going to do your hobby or call it a basement or a wine storage room. You don't want to advertise what may be the primary reason you're uh, building the bunker for. And indeed, it, it can be a multi-use uh, area. Now, things to consider is the cost of the bunker, and it can be quite stunning. Now, for uh, in World War II, the British gave out what was called Morrison bunkers, which was simply really a steel table, uh, which you were to sleep underneath the table, which at first doesn't make a lot of sense, but then you realize, you have to realize a lot of people uh, live in apartments, and so this would give them somewhat of a safe space in case the building collapsed on them where they could be rescued. Or even if it didn't fully result in a collapse, at least flying debris, it would give them some protection. More widely known is what's called the Anderson uh, bunker, where uh, traditionally the British people would uh, implement it in their garden. They would dig down three or four feet, put some corrugated steel there, and then pile up dirt or sand bugs around it. And that, the Anderson uh, bunker, was credited with saving thousands of lives and could be very effective. So um, on fairly uh, low budget, you could probably construct something that would be along the lines of the Anderson uh, shelter, uh, either outside or inside and, in, for example, a basement. You could also uh, create a um, uh, something what I described that we had where you, in effect, build an inner room that has... Uh, the proper supports and so on for uh, some decent protection from the roof and the sides. Now the cost for an improvised shelter could be um, probably under a thousand dollars. Now Atlas survival shelters, uh, their traditional product lines would run a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, and uh, there's been bunkers, private bunkers, that cost millions of dollars. Now, the 
Atlas Survival Shelters, which I've watched a number of their videos. I have no affiliation with them. I'm quite impressed with them. The CEO and the owner seems very sincere, very proud of his products and his service. He's uh, quality oriented. And one of the things to be watched, uh, perhaps even currently or certainly in the future, is he's doing his best to increase his product line to have shelters, uh, very substantial shelters, that would be at the $20,000 or $50,000. And he's also um, trying to obtain uh, some Morrison and uh, Anderson type shelters, which he's having uh, made. So uh, if I was wanting to go with a commercial company, uh, the Atlas Arrival Shelters would be uh, the first company I'd call and see, let them know what your needs are and see what they have to offer. I think equally as important as the bunker is you need the emergency supplies and food, water, and first aid equipment and home self-defense to uh, maintain the shelter during the three days, two weeks plus that you're going to be in it. And I also would share with you that uh, they are not uh, very defendable if you're in the bunker with nobody up the top side that's your allies. Uh, <clears throat> I, um, my father was served with the 3rd Infantry Division, and one time he explained to me how uh, they were just uh, decimated for several days trying to fight through the Siegfried Line, the last offensive unit line into Germany. And they were using a traditional method of trying to put uh, protective fire down into the German pillboxes and then have one or two other guys come up with a satchel charge or a grenade and throw it through the slit where the machine gun shot out. And, and the American troops were just decimated. So on the third day, the 3rd Infantry Division came up with another very innovative way to take these uh, pillboxes down. He said they did it to three of the pillboxes, and the next thing, dozens of pillboxes where the soldier German Nazis were coming out surrendering. Now, another friend of mine who I served in the Navy with told me about his father was a Marine on Okinawa, and he shared with me how they took down the Marines, took down bunkers on Okinawa, and it was incredible. <clears throat> and uh, then when I was researching for this video, I ran through a third way to take down the uh, a bunker, and it was just diabolical. It was evil. And so I decided not to provide any detail on any of those. But unless you have the uh, air vents and the entrances and emergency exit, exit uh, terribly camouflaged, you cannot think you're safe down in that bunker. You have to have up top security, which uh, if the whole point is you're trying to protect yourself and your loved ones and your group from uh, radiation, then that's a challenge. How do you maintain security topside at your entrances and for your uh, air vents? So a lot of key things to uh, consider. If you've enjoyed this video, please click like and subscribe. It helps the channel and it helps the community. Be prepared.